There's a certain kind of creature out there that you don't want to run into. Not even if you run into it with a semi, because that probably won't even do the trick. It's a creature that definitely earned the title of beast, often called the beast or beasts of such and such place, dogmen or werewolves. These monsters are pure voraciousness and viciousness. And today, I have some terrifying truths for you. People who claim to have actually seen these creatures up close. Get ready, it's time to get spooky with these allegedly real werewolf sightings. If you have a creepy encounter of your own, share it with us at darkstories.org or darknessprevails.org slash submit. Now, let's get to it. Werewolf in Montana from Bill B. It was 2015 and I was working as a ranch hand. The ranch I worked for had a couple of hundred heads of cattle. They were held at a separate area that wasn't exactly part of their home ranch. It was about 10 miles away from the area I would usually be working at. It was about six in the evening during the spring when I was contacted on the ranch radio. Yes, we still use those out here, just in case the cell phone service starts ghosting us. Through the radio, I was told that no one had been up to check the cattle for a couple of days and that it would be up to me to do that. So I finished up what I was doing, hopped into my 4x4 Ford Ranger, then headed out to check the herd. It took me a while to get there as the last four miles of road was really more of a doubled up cow trail. It was April and the sun was going down around 7.30 those days. It was getting close to seven by then so it was getting darker fast by the time I made it to the herd. I found them all rather close together, like they had been grouped or gathered up. Most of the time, the cattle do stay in groups with a few separating themselves here and there, but they're never this bunched up in a tight group unless someone was hurting them. On the rare case that they were being attacked, they still didn't bunch up like that. I decided to park my truck for a moment. I reached behind the passenger seat. I grabbed my mag light and my 357 revolver, quickly throwing on the shoulder holster I carried it in. I grabbed the smaller headlamp I had in the glove box and placed it in the passenger seat as well, continuing to drive for a bit towards a stand of brush and trees that the herd seemed to be most interested in watching. I wanted to know why they were keeping an eye on it. I shut off the truck, putting the keys in the ashtray, then grabbing my headlamp and the leather jacket. I turned on the mag light and began to walk over to the stand of trees. It wasn't long before I got that feeling of something being wrong, like I just stepped foot into some place I was not invited, somewhere I wasn't welcome. Still, I had a job to do and cattle to protect. I drew my revolver from its holster then I drew back the hammer, so I was ready if an angry bear came charging out of the woods at me. Walking further into the brush, I found a footprint. It was like a large, slightly deformed dog paw. Moving my light over the expanse of dimly lit forest before me, I looked at the ground with my headlamp for any more signs of disturbance or footprints. I mumbled a few self-deprecating words to myself, the last sentence being, I'm so dumb. Then I heard the exact same words repeat. For a split second, it didn't register to me that my words had been echoed, but then I froze. I didn't even finish the step I was in the middle of. I didn't move, or rather I couldn't move. I fought with my body and mind, reminding myself that it wasn't time to be a freaking iceberg, that I had to move but my body would not cooperate. It really did seem like forever came and went before finally, in a split second, I spun around, mag light in hand, headlamp now illuminating where I thought the reply had come from, and I pointed my revolver, but the hammer went click. It didn't fire. I almost had a stroke right there, a heart attack or something. When I heard the click, 
but saw nothing happen. Then, in the same moment, I saw movement. As soon as my eyes registered that something was there with me, it was gone. But my hearing told me more. It ran through the bushes off to my left, and just as soon as the cracking of twigs and rocks underfoot started, they stopped. I snapped back to myself again, quickly pressing the release on the revolver cylinder and inspecting the rounds. One of them had a dent in the primer, but it didn't fire. I pushed that round out of the cylinder and without realizing it, dropped my mag light to grab one of the 12 bullets in the outside loops of my shoulder holster. Replacing that round and slapping the revolver cylinder back into place, then I looked up, cocking back the hammer again. I looked all around me, slowly, bending down to pick up my mag light after realizing I'd dropped it. I didn't know what to do. Would running provoke this thing into chasing me? Had it taken any of the cattle? Did it really repeat my words to me earlier, mimicking me almost perfectly? Or was that in my head? These questions and paranoia clouded my mind, muddling together with the ever-loudening beat of my heart and the white noise that came with the adrenaline pumping through my body. I stood there, looking around in a circle for several minutes. Finally, a thought broke through the rest and the flight side of my fight or flight took over even in my cowboy boots, which I must stress are in no way good for running, I ran from that forest. My hearing had cleared, allowing me to hear that something else was also running with me through the brush behind me. I blindly fired around back in that direction. I never got any indication that whatever it was had slowed down, but it did let out what I can only describe as a supernatural version of a snarled oof like a beast getting hit in the chest and having some air knocked out of it. I finally could see my truck. I could still hear whatever it was behind me, though. It seemed closer than before. Then something made me duck and roll, and as I did, I felt the air being cut just above my head. When I came back up, the furry mass was before me. I quickly fired at it again, not aiming for anything in particular, but definitely hitting it. This time, I heard a twisted snarl, along with the painful yelp and the growl of a big but hurt dog. I backed up, realizing that I was touching my truck now. I flung open the door and threw myself inside, grabbing the keys from the ashtray and starting it, then flooring the gas pedal. Initially, the truck spun out, and before I took off, something big rammed into the side of my truck, jolting it out of its tire spin and finally getting me moving, pointing in the wrong direction, though. I turned around as fast as I could, gas all the way to the floor. When I hit some rocky ground, the tires took hold. I got up to about 20 miles per hour pretty fast, and if you've ever traveled down a glorified cow trail, that is way too fast, but I didn't have the luxury of slowing down. I was almost to where the trail turned into a road when that animal jumped out in front of the truck. I only sped up, planning to hit the thing, but before I did, it leapt up and ran down the back of my truck, completely unscathed. I didn't slow down, though. I sped back to the homestead faster than I ever had, and by that time, I realized I could have called for help on the radio. I told the rancher that some sort of massive wolf or coyote or something had spooked the cattle and possibly attacked it, and had attacked me. He said he would get in touch with the Forest Service. He had a friend that worked there and would ask him to investigate. It was on Forest Service land, after all, and we technically couldn't hunt the beast down ourselves. I kept telling myself the rest of the night that it was really just a big wolf, but I knew better. The following day, that forest ranger stopped by and came to talk to me. He asked me the usual, what color the creature was, relative size, those sorts of things. Then he asked me something I found to confirm my belief that it wasn't just a wolf. 
he suddenly looked at me and asked, Are you sure it's a wolf? Yeah, I held on to my story. He thought for a moment, then pulled out his phone. Here, take a look at these pictures. I found this kill site this morning while I was out there looking around those woods. I'm not sure what to make of it, but I've seen some bad kills, but I've never seen anything that bloody. I took a look. The only way I can describe what I saw on that phone would be to reference the signs the White Walkers made in Game of Thrones, but only if you turn up the nastiness and blood by tin. There was meat and viscera everywhere. It was like that part of the forest had been painted red. I wanted to vomit. The ranger had taken a small panorama of the site to file with the investigation, and it was insane. He said what that spot used to be was a cow, but now it's nothing more than a crater of mess. After this incident, I was supremely spooked. I ended up moving on to safer employment at a retail store. I'm never going to the woods at night again. I think this event may have given me PTSD. Dogman in Hogan's Lake from Marissa. I'm a religious deer hunter. I enjoy the feeling of sustaining my family, feeding them off the land, but one encounter I had changed me forever. I live near Hogan's Lake, and not far from it is an old military base or land that a lot of us locals use. But back in the day, they used to launch artillery rounds here and use the land for tank practice. You can still see the craters left behind, but now it's quite covered in overgrowth. The local deer love to bed down in them too. It's an odd sight. Anyway, it was a perfect day for hunting. The winds were blowing southwest. It was 34 degrees, just an all-around beautiful fall morning. I am the type of hunter that gets out there way too early, just so I can enjoy the sunrise. It was about an hour and a half before the sun would rise. I am all set up, ready for the morning hunt. I was sitting on my tree stand, laid back and enjoying the fresh air, when my eyes went wide, because in a split second, the woods went from being alive with wildlife to absolute silence. At first, I thought there was something wrong with my ears, but when I shuffled my position to hear better, I could hear myself, but that was it. The sounds around me had stopped. The sun was just beginning to peek above the treetops. I begin to look into the field nearby, and to my surprise, I see a small number of does in the field, but they're all hunkered down trying to hide below the grass. I was dumbfounded, what was going on? I could feel the southwest winds chiseling at my exposed cheeks as I wondered why those does weren't moving. Till out of nowhere, I see something lunge out of the tree line, tearing into the rear end of one of these doe. It was huge. I mean massive. Its arms were almost as long as its entire body, and its head was twice as big as a dog's even if it looked similar to a husky. Its tail was bushy, and its fur was a whitish-gray color. It had bolted out of the woods on four legs and attacked the deer the way a tiger would, but when the deer was done for and the struggling had stopped, this creature stood up like a man, on two legs, towering over the grass, getting a great look at the area around him. In shock, I must have knocked something out of the tree stand. When whatever it was hit the ground, the creature turned and looked right at me. It seemed both startled and angry. It got back down on all fours and instead of running away, it ran right up to my stand. At this point, I'm fumbling with my rifle trying to find the safety, but I was so terrified that I was shaking. When this wolf or dog thing starts to jump at me, 
It easily made it to the branches five feet below me. I aimed and fired, hitting the limb next to it. But I think the sound was enough to spook it, because it stopped and looked up at me on two legs. It seemed to be observing me, wondering if I was worth the trouble. I'll never forget those quarter-sized yellow eyes. Finally, it muttered a low growl, then dropped down, casually walking away back to its prey, picked it up in its mouth before running off with ease into the trees. I stayed in that tree stand for about an hour, making sure that thing was gone. Only when the woods came back to life around me did I feel safe enough to leave the tree stand. Ever since then, I have not been able to muster the strength to return to those woods alone. And now, no matter where I go, hunting has never been the same. The Beast of Mogo Gold Rush Colony From the Angry Dremora I live in New South Wales, Australia. This encounter took place in October of 2014. I was 12 years old at the time, and in my last year of primary school. For the school camp that year, we would spend two days down at Mogo Gold Rush Colony, an old preserved Gold Rush Colony from the times of the Gold Rush in Australia, since at the time we were learning about British colonization and our early history. It's located a few miles south of Batemans Bay and is surrounded by the bush. The bus ride was fun but taxing, as we lived in Wollongong, which is nearly three hours north of Batemans Bay. We finally arrived late in the afternoon. They sorted us into our cabins. My friends and I were put in the cabins closest to the tree line, which was also closest to the bridge leaving from the living quarters. My friends and I had packed our PSPs, board games, and David even brought his small pinball machine that I had bought him for his birthday. We were also completely stocked up on sweets and snacks. We were planning to stay up long into the night having fun. After dinner that night, we were made to sit with our formal partner and listen to the local Aboriginal elder named Sam. I sat on a log with my then girlfriend, Gemma. Sam talked about a lot of things. He went into great depth on the British impact of the Aboriginals. He talked about the troubles they brought along with them and eventually asked if we liked scary stories, and everyone excitedly said yes. Sam then told us that the Aborigines had many creatures from their stories they believed in, like the Bunyip and the Yawa Mawa Yahu. That's what it sounded like. His face eventually grew dark and grim before saying that the British also brought their own monsters with them. He mentioned one beast in particular, that all of us kids recognized, the European werewolf. One boy laughed and said, werewolves aren't real, they're just cool myths made up by movie makers. The old man looked over to the boy and said, well, I pray you never meet one yourself. As cliche and silly as he sounded, he looked dead serious, even concerned, which only made me feel more unsettled. We were then told to go back to our cabins to unwind. It took many of the rowdier cabins a few hours to do that, but soon it was just us. One of the teachers, a Miss R, had to come down because Liam had broke a light bulb by accident, so she had to take him back to stay with teachers because the assistant principal had also gone with us. So she had to follow the school's protocol, leaving only Cohen, Brody, Lachlan, David, and myself. Lachlan had been hit by an extreme homesickness, though, which had him crying, and so Brody, being the legend he was, kept him company, comforting him and telling him, it's all gonna be alright, Lachlan, we're gonna have a great time. We all had a set of double bunk beds lining the cabin, up to the bathroom at the back. It was like a flat, almost, quite a cozy double cabin. Another group had one next door to us, the cabin only had two windows, one in between my bunk and Lachlan and Brody's bunk bed, and the other above the toilet. A silly place to have a window that's not tinted in some way. 
but it did have a shutter that we kept open for light from the outside. At around 1 a.m., it began pelting down rain. Lachlan was still crying. David was playing his PSP with his headphones in, and Cohen and I were talking. I had the urge to go to the bathroom, and as I stood there doing my business, I suddenly heard Lachlan screaming. The, the window! Th there was something standing there! I glance out the window to the side of the cabin, and I, I see it. A huge black figure covered in fur. It appeared to be squatting on two legs, which were bent back like a Hollywood werewolf. Its arms were down to its knees with long, bony fingers that ended in claws the length of steel nails. It had a semi-muscular build and the head of a dog. But there was something wrong with it. Its maw was more like a wolf's, and its ears were more small. It had a shaggy mane and wet black nose that dripped from the downpour outside. It had placed one of its hands on the window, looking inside at the kids. With its other hand, it scraped down the glass with a claw, as if measuring how thick it was. Its face was mischievous, intelligent. It enjoyed the fear that it was giving Lachlan. I began to slowly close the shutter of the bathroom window, not taking my eyes off the thing. However, the blinds made a loud squeak, and as soon as I started, the beast turned instantly to face me. I wished I hadn't done that. The beast stared at me. That was when I got a good look at its face. I tremble every time I think of that face. Words fail to describe exactly what I saw but I'll do my best. Its eyes were like a bright amber that seemed to glow in the embers of a fire. It slowly began to bare sharp teeth at me with a sinister-looking snarl, a mixture of saliva and rain dripping from its exposed mouth. It let out a low growl so deep I could feel it vibrating my chest. I was completely frozen in fear and I could feel myself lost in the thing's eyes. Its gaze was one of hatred and rage, but I felt a sense of curiosity too. I wanted to see what it was going to do next, even if that meant trying to attack me. It began to run its long razor-like claws down the side of the wooden wall of the cabin. All the while, it didn't break eye contact with me. I could see the black claws glistening in the rain from the light of the gazebo. Then I saw a flashlight bobbing behind it. The teachers, they must have heard Lachlan screaming because all of them came down from the trail. The beast then glared angrily in their direction before giving me one last look. It got down on all fours and began to take off at an alarming speed, kicking up bark chips everywhere. I raced to the window it was at before and watched the beast bound towards the colony and over the bridge. All the while, it kicked up that dirt and grass. David had been playing his PSP with headphones in and did not hear or see any of this. Brody had stayed on the bottom bunk, which he chose to stay put in, as Cohen stayed in his. Lachlan was now sobbing hysterically at this point. The teachers unlocked the door and burst inside. Lachlan kept saying there was a monster at the window, but Miss Chapman didn't believe him. She turned to me and asked, uh, Did you see a monster? I pointed at the scratches on the window without saying a word and moved past her to climb into my bunk. Miss Chapman observed them and then simply said she would find the little troublemaker who did this, to which I replied, Good luck. She clearly didn't see the size and width of the scratches, or she refused to buy that something did that, as in Australia we don't have big cats or bears, so I guess to her it was nothing. Most of my friends managed to fall asleep, even Lachlan, but I lay there, wondering if it was going to come back, wondering what it wanted to do. I then closed the shutter to the window above my head, and soon I drifted off to sleep.
I woke up last. I had slept through a lot. Liam had come back and was being rowdy and messing about with David. David was chasing him up and down the cabin in nothing but an Iron Man mask and underwear, screaming like a maniac. David was quite out of shape, so you can imagine how absurd he looked. Lachlan, Brody, and Cohen were quiet. We didn't speak a word until we got changed for the day. That day we were taken on a tour of one of the mines that had been restored, and David and I decided to split off from the group and explore the colony ourselves. As we wandered through the town, he couldn't help but wonder why there were claw marks on some of the walls of the old buildings. This sent chills down my spine. I knew what did it. I know what I saw the previous night. We decided to check out the back of a barber shop, which was immediately backed by thick forest. There, we were hit by a foul odor. David said we should follow it to find what it is. This sounded like a terrible idea, but I gave in to peer pressure, and I was curious if we would run into our hairy friend again. But what we saw made me throw up. In a clearing not too far from the barber's back lot was a mangled mess that used to be a kangaroo. There were parts of it scattered all over the ground and forest at the base of a large gum tree. It looked like something much bigger than it had slammed it against the tree repeatedly. David breathed. What the heck could have done this? I urged him that we should leave, and we did, rejoining the group who were down the road at the blacksmith. I then took the chance to tell him what we saw the previous night that he had missed. I told him how Liam used to own a book called Werewolves, Vampires, and Zombies, which contained a section on cryptids. In particular, I told him about the Beast of Bray Road and how it looked similar to the drawing in that book. He wasn't skeptical at all, given the slaughtered kangaroo we found. Soon the guide led us to the barber with the class, and not long after that, everyone began complaining about the smell. So the guide discovered the handiwork of the beast for himself, and then told us to go back to the old schoolhouse, before gold panning. Soon I saw a few other workers meet up with him to help. They discussed what to do with the situation. They then disappeared to clean up the monster's masterpiece. During lunch, David and I went to explore the caravan park, stumbling upon the largest gaggle of geese we'd ever seen. These geese were vicious, though, and roamed the whole property. After that night of formal dance practice, we returned to the cabin and unwinded for bed. Before it got dark, I closed the outside still shutters in the windows, and we locked everything down. We even shut the blinds for good measure. I locked the doors, and with help from Lachlan, we barricaded the door with the wardrobe. Liam didn't understand why we were doing all this, and asked what on earth was going on. I simply told him the lock was busted. We all fell asleep that night fairly fast, to the sounds of cicadas, cicadas, and crickets. But I was slowly awakened at around four by a subtle bump. The sounds of the night had ceased, not even the early birds you'd hear were sounding up. The thumping continued, and soon it sounded like the screeching of still as something began to claw at the metal around the building, which there wasn't a lot of, so it had to have been going out of its way to do this. I knew immediately that the beast was back. I was beginning to shake and feel nauseous, thinking that that thing could easily smash its way inside. I closed my eyes, beginning to pray, reciting the Lord's words, and asked for aid. Soon I could hear it growling at something, then the scratching and thumping ceased. I then hear the distinctive sound of geese, followed by a deafening roar that shook the building. Suddenly, there was the sound of fluttering and whacking sounds. The cries of the geese grew louder, hundreds of them. Then there was another roar that seemed annoyed. It growled and snarled, and then walked away into the bush. The sounds of the geese heckling it continued and seemed to follow it, and soon everything went quiet again, 
and the sounds of the night returned. By then, everyone was now awake from the commotion. Liam was begging to know what happened. I told him I wasn't sure. After unlocking everything at 5.30 a.m. and unbarricading the door, Lachlan and I decided to examine the outside of the cabin, and it was a mess. Claw marks down the shutter, indentations in the wood from it pounding and pounding, bark chips everywhere, feathers scattered about the ground, a few dead geese. We moved the dead birds away. We knew we'd be questioned about the damage, and the dead geese wouldn't help so we dumped them into the creek separating the cabins from the colony. We then began to pack our things. Later that morning, we stopped at the Mogo Zoo, and shortly after that, we were on our way home. We didn't talk much on the bus ride. The past two nights had been very traumatic for us, and Liam and Brody remained skeptical, even though the evidence of the creature was right there. A few months passed, and I'm starting high school during that time. I became obsessed with Skyrim, and when I did that quest line where you could become a werewolf, I felt nauseous at the sight of it. It was uncanny how similar the werewolf in that game and the beast we saw a few months back were. The only person I ever told was my dad. With a frightened expression, he quickly believed me and told me his own story, which happened in Moriua. That's 30 minutes south of the Gold Rush Colony. He was sleeping in a granny flat under the house, which could only be accessed from the outside. He and his brother woke up to what sounded like the tapping of steel on the glass. He looked and saw the beast with the head and face of a dog or wolf peeking in at him, grinning with that same grin I saw that rainy night. To this day, I wonder what would have happened to us if we hadn't been separated by a wall from that terrifying monster who turned animals into pulp. Make sure you're either extremely fast or you have several inches of steel wall between you and the werewolf you stumbled upon. Otherwise, you're about to become a big, red, smushy mess. And if that happens, you won't be able to share your story with us. So survive for the sake of scary stories and to warn others about how monstrous werewolves and dogmen really are. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode of Darkness Prevails, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you have a story of your own you want to share with us, go to darknessprevails.org slash submit or go to darkstories.org. If you want to support the show, check the links in the description. There's a link to my Patreon where you can donate and a link to our store where you can buy some cool merch. Now, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous video. Titled, It Took My Child, Seven Real Monster Sightings. Lita Wolf Webb says, I work the night shift in a hospital, and I'm always going through the morgue and hearing fun party noises. However, I believe they're starting to get annoyed because I declined their invitation at night. Are the ghosts partying over there? At least they're happy ghosts, at least, right? Let's make sure you keep them happy. Vanessa Torado says, Seven likes in one view. YouTube is on crack. Well, considering modern YouTube, I'd rather it be on crack than sober. KW says, what's with these terrible titles? Five ghost stories, for example, was way better, or five Wendigo stories for people who are not subbed and searching for scary stories. Maybe that's because people like me to repeat topics, and calling something volume such and such is irritating and boring. I mean, just sit back and think about it. Reuse the same title over and over with new stories that may not be seen because the title's the same, or tease it with one of the titles of the stories. Sounds like a no-brainer to me, and it allows me to be a bit more general with the stories I pick, covering topics and stories that I haven't been able to for years. Jessica Strickland says, This channel is a strange one. Thank you, Jessica. I do enjoy being strange and making you all strange with me. Levamorn says, If we find cryptids on another world, are they really cryptids or just animals? Okay, let me clear up something for you. 
Something is encrypted because we haven't officially discovered it yet. Once it's cataloged, we're good. It's no longer encrypted. All cryptids are animals. So if we land on a planet and it's covered with animals that are easy to locate and catalog and study, they're not cryptids. They're only cryptids up to the point that that happens. Cryptid just means mysterious animal. Just keep it at that. Well, this brings us to the end of this Darkness Prevails episode. But don't you worry. More scary stories are on the way soon. So stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons who continue to donate. They're very, very attractive people. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy. Because this world is a strange one.